So my name is Tammy Allen, uh, and the, the topic we're going to hit on tonight is emergency but a quote of, I hear an echo, is that okay? Yeah, an echo? I got it. Okay, you got it. Uh, with a focus of preparing as a community to help each other as a community, impromptu or not, better if we could plan ahead, much better, but to act out of love, not fear, because I've met so if you Google preparedness and you find people just kind of bearing, dashing, protecting what they have versus figuring out how to help each other. Voters are already, voters always help each other. Voters after 9-11, the boat lift. Voters after the Bahamas with a jet and rescued 100 people. Voters of Loma Prieta. That's how we moved all the people in and out of the area. Voters after Lahaina. Um, voters after the shoe swap. We just had a fire in British Columbia. And that was the only way to get out of the fire was on both sides of the community. And they had to get out by boat. So we know voters are going. We kind of do emergency preparedness every week and tie the boat. You're on your own. You have the alternate communication, alternate power. You are your own rescue. So we're already in that mindset. Um, and we have colder water. Um, so the whole idea of having voters be part of the emergency preparedness. Oh, even the volcano in New Zealand, those were dinghies. Fires in Australia, those were dinghies. So they don't have to be huge vessels, it's just the idea that every vessel might be able to help out. So the idea did come up back in during Loma Prieta, I don't know how many years that was now, 89, somewhere. And then with Katrina, 2005, six. And then with the oil spill, I worked on that, 2010. That using local vessels, using local knowledge, using community resources, vessels of opportunity is a really smart way to do it. They're already distributed. They already have the skill set. You already have a skill set that's unique. So if we looked at earthquake, let's just use earthquake. Think of every single bridge that now has to be inspected. It's it's either stuck up or it's stuck down or it's closed and trying to get people north and south or east and west in Seattle is going to be a game changer. Trying to get people north and south using our salt water instead of trying to use our highways. We have a common highway. Uh, we've talked to the State Department of Emergency Management about the larch when there's the mud like oh so but more of just an eruption and the larch coming down and covering I-5, using vessels to to bridge that gap. So the tool, it's more of, a, I think of it as a tool. And, and then the cool thing happened. The city started to listen to that idea. And the firefighters that had gone and worked at Katrina, they came back and said, you know, we should really talk about boats more like yes so the idea of using vessels of opportunity community boat owners doing public service in an organized way and like you said that was vessel owners just spontaneously volunteering spontaneous volunteering is awesome because you do show up with a lot of training but being part of an emergency management you get all of that support from the mission. So if I'm gonna go help a city or an emergency management center, an EOC, then I'm under their mission number, the boat is protected insurance wise, the vessel may get fuel to get that next run. And so being organized as a boating community, as a resource in an operation, that's the way to go. And that was a struggle for a decade of trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, my boat's worth a lot of money and I'm gonna just load a bunch of people on there. 
and not know where I'm taking them. No, we don't want that. We want to have it done much more safely and organized and have somebody know that you're available and ask you to deploy and support you in that deployment. And that's what that's what I want to tell you about. So it's okay. called the flotilla. Uh, Bainbridge Prepares is the nonprofit. And it could it could have been a yacht club. It just happened to be Bainbridge Prepares because they're dealing with a lot of other stuff. They're dealing with power, child uh, safety, family reunification, psychological first aid, disaster medical centers. They've got, I mean, they did all the vaccinations and the testing and all. So it's a huge group, but part of it is the flotilla. But it could be a yacht club. It could be a yacht club that goes to their city and says, we have 50 vessels and 50 captains and 200 crew members and all this fuel, alternate communication, shelter, transportation. We would like to be at the table when you're figuring out what you're gonna do with this neighborhood, my neighborhood, and, and make it personal. So it's wherever the group of voters reside, that's where you want to offer your services. But to be at the table, Kitsap, Department of Emergency Management, they've got um, wings on Kitsap. So those are personal pilots um, with their own private airplanes doing exactly what I'm talking about. Hoofs on Kitsap, which are horse owners who are doing the same thing. I can ride over a, 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 a you know, a slide area or a closed road. I can bring people back. You want me to carry supplies? What do you need? Hoof, hoof, hoof some kids out. Boats on kids out, obviously. Um, and now they've even got wheels on kids out because the mountain bikers aren't going to be left out of this. So <laughs> if there's a way you can help, you figure out what you're good at and then you organize it within your own, um, your own cities. Um, it's going to be the city. Uh, so we were lucky enough to get a nonprofit to sit down at the table with our city, the city government, where our emergency manager resides, to sit down with our fire department. And when that happened, everything worked. You know, I had been working on this flotilla and we had our boats and we had our boats, but we didn't really know how we were all gonna do it. And at the beginning, it was kind of like the Mau or every, the Cajun Navy, they're the perfect example. The Cajun Navy, they just show up. They're like, we don't wanna be on a roster. We don't wanna be insured by your company, your um, organization. We just wanna show up, do our thing, feed our people and not be part of the organization. Ours are actually part of the organization. So if you could choose if you're gonna be a spontaneous volunteer and then you have to fix everything after and you're in for your own fuel and there is not gonna be much fuel available after an earthquake. So that fuel is a big issue. Question. So that group like the Cajun Navy, which has done an amazing amount of support, um, do they communicate with the umbrella organizations that are doing the or the rescue and like does your group how do they communicate with these ad hoc groups that are coming in yeah so the question was a, a cajun navy as an example do they are they part of the structure or not and our flotilla are we part of the structure or not and how do we deal with all the ad hoc groups uh, our goal is to not be ad hoc and the cajun navy probably recognizing that dealing with a big national event, it was faster to just gun it. Go get them, get them out. We'll pay for the gas. I don't feel like talking to anybody about receipts or burn rate. And they just do it completely funded on their own. And it works. It's working great. What I'm trying to do, and partly because I was a government employee, trying to give some training ahead of time 
uh, an ID card ahead of time so they can walk into the EOC and work with me. We can, we can share confidential information. I can deploy them. They can help me. They can respond. Can't do that if you're not connected. In the Cajun Navy, they were on their own and did great. The guy in the jet ski in the Bahamas, he didn't have an ID card. He had a jet ski and he just kept going in and out rescuing people. That is still going to happen. And I, I want that to still happen. There's never going to be enough time to organize what we're going to do. We'll still do that while all the spontaneous volunteering continues to happen. Because you at fire, there was no way we would have had a plan for that. We're we're thinking more on the earthquakes had happened. Five days later, the captain of the port says we can go back in the water. Two days later, we're starting to get those poor souls that are stuck on the island or off the island back to start reuniting families, getting staff to work, getting our emergency medical staff back and forth, getting our firefighters who live off island. Our police, fire, and most of our service workers live off island. You can guess. Property prices are too high to live on the island. So that's where um, our flotilla is first going to be deployed. Everything before that, the waters are closed. If they do anything, it be more of a on your own because it's not even able to be on the water. So we're learning this. We're learning that the waters are going to be closed for the first few days. Yeah. Yeah. The official use, the official use of the water, the common highway is still governed by the Coast Guard captain of the port. And um, I want to remember her name. She's amazing. And then Tim Lufer is the one that we're talking to now. And they basically shut down all boat traffic until they can decide if it's safe. It's debris and flammability. So there were, I would have jumped in the water too if I was in Lanai. But many of them perished because of the fluids that were burning on the surface of the water and the air quality. And so they kind of, you know, in our case, that the first thing is everything shuts down. You're on the water. You get at, you're getting to shore. Um, but that's who it is. It's the captain of the port, and it's the nav. Is the common highway being closed? That's mainly commercial and government and official. It doesn't stop volunteers, but the debris, the currents. Let me jump. I jump a lot, but let me jump to why that would be important. When you have a chance, go to um, DNR's website and find the tsunami modeling for the Seattle Puget Sound area. And if you want, just come right into like Blakely Harbor or Eagle Harbor or the Seattle waterfront. I might be able to, I can't go to my page right now, but I, uh, I, oh, let me try. The tsunami fault line. Well, fortunately we did so much ahead of time we remove the barriers that were there. That's the biggest win. When, when fire department and the city and the people that lived in the community weren't together, then there was there were barriers. So if I only have two police officers on duty at the time of a big event, there's no way they can deal with all that. The firefighters are trying to deal with they're dealing with. And the community is growing and they can't all call 911. So we started out with, okay, we need a plan ahead of time. You do your house, you do your house, you do your street, your street musters, you figure out what you need. You go to your neighborhood center, which is a hub there the city and the fire department and this group that I talked about, Bainbridge Repairs, there's a medic, there's a radio operator, there's a shelter. 
we don't want you expecting the government to come deal with the primary things they would usually deal with. I'm thinking just the smooth it out. Um, Uh, did, did, did the Zoom folks hear that? Right. I can hear you, but we can't really hear, hear the person. I'm going to try to recap. Tell me your first name. John. I'm going to try to recap what John was saying. He asked when at one point the government is interferes with the ability to respond to the community. And the example was in Lahaina where the person that represents the faith communities came to the island with money and ready to help. The, the question from the community was, are you with the government? As that would be a hindrance for them to help. And now I'm gonna back to my voice. Um, that's the beauty of having a nonprofit in there because it does need to be that nonprofit that can just go right in and do, 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 because they're not constrained by budgets, mission numbers. But I just feel like the support, well, okay. He said, let me back up. Um, John said, in a historical lack of trust. Here, let's go back to, I, I didn't get to tell you at the very beginning of why we even have this uh, group that has formed that has now like a thousand volunteers, it's amazing, was the decision to go between, am I going to react to an emergency out of fear or am I going to react to an emergency out of love for my community or I've trained, I feel prepared and now I can give. So we can, uh, we can, prepare to defend ourselves or we can prepare to share and help mm. and it just feels a lot easier it feels a lot easier to to do that um, we saw it with the pandemic where you know we are an island we're kind of like okay we're not gonna let any fairies i mean we could have been really protected and instead what they did is they set up programs and volunteers and testing centers and vaccinations. And once we were all done, then we went to other counties and kept giving. I think that's where we're going with the voters. It doesn't, I haven't been able to test it. We've only gone out on the water to train. So we practice with boats moving people back and forth. And I'm gonna show you a quick video on that. We've practiced moving patients. We haven't practiced 2,000 people on the beach frantically pulling at the captain to get on their boat to take them across. That would be the breakdown. That would be a loss in the trust of government or a loss in the trust of making that all work. That's where the planning comes in. Having enough volunteers to marshal and organize um, and I think if, if a community is more comfortable getting it from their faith, um, like a church comes to give it to them, that's one of the teams that we've already set up. If, if I'm not going to take help because I have animals and I'm not going to come with you because I have to stay with my animals, then we have a team that deals with the animals so they can go to the shelter with their animals. Um, if I'm not getting help because of a disability, we have a whole team of interpreters, a whole team of people just to do psychological first aid. It's a requirement to be a boat captain in the flotilla. You have to learn incident command system. You have to learn psychological first aid. You have to know how you fit in with this big organization so that that trust doesn't, doesn't falter. I mean, you're a vulnerable population when you're going to get on someone's boat and maybe you've never been on a boat. Now you've got a bit, aside from a ferry, and now you're going to trust this captain to bring you safely back to your family. There's got to be, there's going to have to be that trust there. Um, 
So let's watch the video. It's only three minutes. Help me out, Paul. Are we ready? I, well, you're already in the room. I'm going to have to okay, share Paul's the video. Okay, Paul's going to share the video. For the video, I mean, you're, so this is, you control the projector. Okay, and, and then I'm going to make... Oh, um, and we'll see if we can put the screen in the middle. Can we play at the same time? Uh, no, I just did. Okay. I think we might want to do that. <laughs> oh, cool. That, that actually worked. Um, that's the end of it. Mine's still buffering, but you're able to see the laptop. And that does. Oh, that's pretty distracting. How about I close it? Uh, well, we can. Where I can Are you going to go back to the projector? The only thing I was going to show, and I think I should do that now, escape. Put it there. Back to the and it's still shot if it comes through. We might do it verbally. If you can look at the modeling for the tsunami, so there's two two tsunami preparation scenarios we're working on. The one that the Cascadia subduction zone, we have maybe an hour. 
there's going to be time to get information. Then you do what you need to do based on where you are. So if you're not on your boat, you shouldn't be going towards the boat. Well, where, where is that quake information? Where is, where is that quake originally? The first one I talked about is the Cascadia subduction offshore. So all of the big sound signals that they've installed along the shoreline on the Washington Post, that's the Cascadia subduction zone, big, um, the big earthquake. But we live in Seattle. So they've just finally finished the modeling for the Seattle fault. Bainbridge, the fault goes right under Bainbridge Island. So we're paying attention. Um, so they did the modeling for the Seattle fault and that one, there is no warning. You're experiencing it at the same time as everyone else. And you're getting the, re the result on the water immediately. So for that one, they're trying to get people to train and understand that they evacuate the area ground immediately, just immediately. We'd always thought, and this was earlier, back in the old days, and we were like, yeah, we'll have a flotilla. Well, then they did the modeling and the speed of the water at, for the first 48 hours or longer, like 20 knots. The, so the speed, the Seattle. The Seattle. So we aren't going to get on the water right away. It won't be like we can be Lahaina, where we jump in the boat and we help. Not for earthquake, but definitely for fire. Um, and definitely for anything else. If there is a, a communication breakdown, we're using ham. Tell me ham. Are there any ham folks? Yes. All right. Two. Yes. Um, you're really important because the EOC uses ham. The boaters all use VHF. There is no, the, the EOC doesn't have VHF. The Emergency Operations Center, you know, assume phones are dead. Assume phones are gone. And we're just dealing with flags, running with notes, or ham. So the ham, the one ham in your community can talk to the emergency operations to find out information. So if you can get a ham, it's worth it. It's totally worth it. Because then you'd have your VHF to talk to the voters and you'd have your ham to talk to the land operations. Do you have a question? It sounds like you're like, ham, ham. Oh, okay. Yeah. No satellite. Oh, okay. So a question from the audience is, well, what about satellites? Yes. It's just not an unaffordable level that the general community would have it. So we we don't assume the folks with Starlink, they're gonna be golden. Yeah. Um, Unless it gets uh, jammed. Do you the ones that give you the ability to text the satellite? Yeah, outside. So a uh, question from the audience was, what about the little individual personal, star, your personal satellite communicator to send a text? Absolutely. And then again, the economy of scale, it won't, uh, it'll be fine because you can tell your family in Texas, I'm good. It won't work for ongoing, trying to coordinate a ham radio. You can really like, did you get that? Okay, well, this is where I am now. Okay, well, now let's go here. Can you help me? That's where uh, amateur radio using simplex and duplex is going to be a game changer. And we're practicing, we go out on the boats and we practice simplex, but then we we want to use duplex. We want to use the repeaters and get really far and have all kinds of communication, but we think repeaters will get damaged as well. So you're really just doing like boaters have, line of sight communication. Maybe you can get five miles. So, um, we use flags. So you saw in the video, they had their Bravo India flag. Bravo India, just, we made it up. Bainbridge Island, 
we've been talking to Vashon, like you guys could do this too. There's another letter for you. And we're talking to Kingston. Well, wouldn't that be cool if you were a commuter on a ferry, your kids are back on the island to be able to figure out what boat you need to ask for a ride on eventually. I mean, because you're supposed to have your stuff with you and you're supposed to be packed for 21 days. But that's that's going to be the hardest part is the details of day-to-day -day trying to deal with people being stranded. On this, uh, talk to me a little bit more about the 20 map. Okay. Uh, I don't have the bandwidth. I wish I could show you the modeling. Do you have a do you have a way to go to I should have a projector? So you don't yeah. Have to take, take take the projector. I don't have yeah. They go for the worst case scenario. The highest tide, the nine point one earthquake. But what was impressive, and I never really thought of, I always thought inundation, but it creates these whirlpools. So they had footage from Japan, their tsunami, and they had a photograph, and they said, well, okay, well, you see the whirlpool. We could all see the whirlpool. Like, you see that little speck in the middle? I'm like, yeah, that's a barn. The size of the whirlpool is so huge. And the, and, the, and the modeling is, and so I don't know if maybe you Google Department of Natural Resources tsunami modeling, because mine are big files, and then it will, I don't think it will. Uh, could you send? Uh, yes. And, okay. Should we want to watch a video of it, or? Do you actually have one? Um, Let me read some of it. Up here? That's the website. It was July. That's it. Let's try that. All righty. You just nailed it. Can the Zoom folks see it too? Yeah, Zoom folks can see this too. They probably can't hear you very well at the moment. I need to get the laptop over near you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I lost one of the super gates. <laughs> That's right. It's the worst case scenario, but it gets our gets the same. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me uh, bring it over now. Okay. Commentary. All right. So I'm going to try to comment on this. In, in July uh, last last year, 2022, the the folks, um, University of Washington Department Ecology Department of Natural Resources got together to talk about how high the water would be, which we've kind of been getting that for the last 10 years, but now they could show us the speed of the whirlpools. And then do I hit go? How do you get it there? Uh, I think it is playing. It is playing, playing. okay. I'm not, I'm not hearing any audio. Which I, so I they're focusing on the Seattle fault zone, which is where we're sitting right now. And of course, what do I have in my car? I have a radio, I have my ham radio and a water bottle. So I'm not even ready, but they should have, they should show the modeling pretty soon. The red lines are just showing us where all the cracks are. And look at the ones that go right through Bainbridge, right through. <laughs> okay, so the earthquake begins. And if you're able to move our pictures, you'll be able to see what the depths are, 10 feet or higher. And so it seems Bainbridge-centric, but when I look at Eagle Harbor and it just pushes and pushes and pushes, it covers the road. The Seattle waterfront, I thought I went over there. That's the Seattle waterfront right there. So all of our ships, our um, the, the cranes, it's just pushing up through Duwamish like a rolling pin. <laughs> no, I think the primordial should look pretty messy too. <laughs>
Crescent City, right. And if you're, for the folks on Zoom, he's mentioning looking back at Crescent City and Brookings, Oregon, when we had the tsunami that came through. And Santa Cruz was a perfect scenario. The water wasn't even moving fast, but it just kept crumbling boats, the hydraulics. Um, yeah. So there, the one brochure that, <clears throat> um, and we can close that up with one. I think it did its thing. Okay. The main thing was about that, just up into the higher elevations or mm -hmm. into the pinched areas is mm -hmm. where it really goes. Yeah. Yeah, for people to look at that. Um, yeah, and I showed the URL of the previous video as well. Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. Audio wasn't coming through, so. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, Correct. So I got to I got to run back to Moss Landing in 1986. Everybody's sitting at the bar and they're all talking about what they're going to do if there is a tsunami because we're in Moss Landing, California, which is like tsunami. Expect central. Yes, tsunami central. And they're all talking about jumping on their boats. And I'm looking back and going, we were all hanging out at the bar. Nobody was sober to get on their boat. And half of them didn't have fresh fuel. The boats hadn't left for a year. If they had gotten on their boats, now we've got a stranded boat owner um, offshore. So that whole thing about go to deep water, which is what we always heard, in Puget Sound, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because the whirlpools, even though it's deep, it's too constrained. The circulation zones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Diane just said it's the liquefaction zones, all of that area underwater and in liquefied, right? So the big the big stressor now would be on um, the ship owners like the passenger ships and the cruise ships moving 5,000 people to 200 foot elevation at the beginning of an earthquake. That they don't have a lot of time to get. They do have some time. So if you can spread that word to boaters, get off your boat. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard for them to leave their boat and go to high ground, but that is really what we have to do. And then it's two weeks later that I talk about, you know, join a flotilla, talk to your EOC, because the recovery period is so long. The two completely different concepts really is about the emergency and then the recovery. I'm all about the recovery because. I'm not going to be near a boat during the emergency. I'm mm -hmm. planning to be on the boat to help with the recovery. But what's the plans you have? How's your boat? So I heard a question. What was my plan for the what boat after? Oh, ah, yes. So we, um, so the question was, how, how are we going to get to have, let's say there's 100 boats, I might have 20 that survived, and of that, I might have half of them, that the owners are healthy and able, and they've taken care of their family, and they can run the boat. So we have, we have, what do we need, five times more volunteers and vessels than we think we might need. Um, but that that would be our first thing. So they have their ham radio. We have the earthquake. They deal with their family and their pets and their street and their neighborhood. They've dealt with their hub. And then that next night at 7 p.m., we all get on the radio. We're like, okay, just checking in. You all checked on your boats yet? And then it won't be until the government says, Will you go pick up a, a five firefighters and medics and police officers from somewhere 
that's when we get to work. We don't do anything until, so first we find out how many boats survive. Then we um, do a damage assessment for all of our docks and places where we can land. Then we start organizing the boats that survive, and then we wait for a, a request. Once there's a mission and there's a deployment, then we fill the request. Yacht clubs in Seattle and boating clubs like the like this new tribe I'm joining, um, the city doesn't necessarily know you could do that. And our city didn't know we could do that. But fortunately, we had a nonprofit that really got into it. We had a county emergency manager that worked in the Caribbean where they had a flotilla, they had an earthquake, they used it, it worked. And then we had our, a city government that has an emergency manager that has dealt with earthquakes and she's like, yeah, we can totally do this. That's what it took. Yeah. Question. <laughs> Um, very good emergency management plan, and they have never any bumps. And I think you get this general um, benefit by going to their website and finding out. It all seems to be land based, though. Like, how, how, to, how to keep yourself healthy at home. Um, there's a lot of good tips and there's low prices, and they've got that down pretty well. And it's a great resource for people. But they never mention voters. Correct. We're hoping, we're hoping that starts to change. So one of the conferences I went, oh, let me repeat. She was saying how the cities have done a really good job with neighborhood, map your neighborhood, get your bag ready, get your street ready, your family, your neighborhood, your hub, your disaster community. But they haven't really talked about boats as part of that. And recently, well, everything's kind of recent, I don't know when it was. It was a, a kind of a maritime disaster conference. And we were talking about ham radio because there not a lot of them were using ham there. They use VHF, darn it. They've got a VHF radio in the cockpit, but we're like, well, how are you gonna talk to anyone else? And so, yeah, yeah, so for, uh, yeah, so there are two comments was uh, speak a little bit more about this ham. And the other is that most boats don't have a ham. Correct. So VHF, the, you're not allowed to have your VHF on. You're not supposed to like do a road trip and be talking on VHF to another car because the FCC, it's for marine use. Um, and then like CBs, they have their little place in the spectrum of waves. Ham, amateur radio, they have a nice big chunk of wave frequencies that are allotted to them. And they're using medium frequency and high frequency and VHF is very high frequency. So you guys are in a different place on the map. You're all talking, but you're not talking on the same wavelength so that you don't mess it all up. So we have, ham operators have their own set of frequencies that they're allowed to talk on and they can talk on land and you can bring your ham radio and go anywhere land or sea it's a question mm -hmm. correct it's a so the question was is this the same if my boat had a single sideband or a truck had a cb or a single sideband it's different based on permission to use those frequencies, the licensing. So the easiest license to get is an amateur radio technician's license. It's a test, it's a bunch of questions. You don't have to memorize Morse code, you just get it done. And then you buy a $30 bail thing or a better radio, because you're gonna be sick of it immediately and you want a better radio, but having an amateur radio links you to the people on land, where VHF does not. No. Oh, the question was, does ham have the line of sight limitation? The beauty of ham 
is that you can use, you can do the line of sight, but you can also talk to a repeater antenna and bounce it to another, like I want to talk to Polsbo, but I'm in Eagle Harbor. I can go up to another antenna and relay it to the other side. And that's the beauty of ham. So these people that are really into it, the guys with the six antennas on their truck, they like to talk to Australia. They'll do it at night because they're bouncing the wave across the globe. It's, I don't do that. I barely, I understand. Say it one more time. Yeah, so the question was the infrastructure. Yeah, the repeater antennas have to be up for it to work. And, or you need to have a neighbor who tells a neighbor who tells a neighbor who tells a neighbor. And so the more people that have those licenses and those, that equipment, especially on boats, is going to help with the entire process of getting information out. And this is, you know, Yes, we have Starlink and satellite, and they're figuring out how to connect ham with satellite and all that. But I think the basis is just to get a ham license. You got a ham radio. See if your local um, emergency management people have a need they haven't thought of. Those bridges, you guys have so you are you have so many islands here. When you think about every bridge that's down. I mean, we think about being on an island every day because we can't go anywhere without catching a ferry or getting on a bridge. But you really are a bunch of little islands. And so I could see boaters being the connection right here, Puget Sound Yacht Club, getting people to the other side because those two bridges are closed just to get people home. One way trip. Yeah. So I, I know that. Uh... They had to get their license. Up the ionosphere to different places, uh, depending on the time of day and sunspots and that kind of thing, it can affect perception. But you can communicate to another person with a sideband. You don't have to have antennas in the middle. And the people on the boats did have their amateur license as well. So a single sideband is, is a subgroup. They blank out some of the ham can use all the frequencies. Marine single sideband is restricted on a few of them. So unless you have a ham license, don't talk on a ham frequency. So a single sideband is a subset of ham. Basically. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry, Zoom folks. They're talking about radios, but that could go deep. But basically, get your license. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, cool. I have. So that's my main thing is just trying to like think through how the boat. The other cool thing, it gives you an excuse to keep your boat running. It gives you an impetus to keep it fueled. Fresh water, keep it running. Practice, be out there, because and, and if and I always tell like groups that don't have boats, like now you get to get a boat. That's how you're gonna sell the idea. I need it. It's our, it's our go plan, but it's just such a good tool. But Tammy, I want to uh, give Joe a chance to get back to you. It's okay. Let's carry on. Well, I think I got all my questions. Well, I'm done. So one way to get a hold of me, Tammy at Bainbridge Prepares. Yeah. Well, if you say we want to buy a fresh statement, I know that you uh trailer your boat up uh, north into Canada. Yeah. So I just want to make sure five minutes and just Okay, new topic. Yeah. Um, so Vincent says, like, yeah, tell star. So we sold the seventeen foot, seventeen ton, fifty foot wood boat, which I spent all the time going to Port Townsend to haul out. Got this 28 foot Telstar, put it on the back of the trailer, towed it with the Tacoma to Egmont, British Columbia, and went up Jervis Inlet into Malibu Rapids, loved it. Octopus Islands, loved it. 
put it back on the trailer, came home. So that was our first trip. Francisco was the Yes. Without the whole schlep of getting up there, we just had to drive onto the ferry twice. And that was that was the hardest part, was driving the trailer onto the ferry and launching it in Egmont because they're little tiny launch ramps and you have to back down an S-curve. Um, <laughs> but we loved it. And so we, got, we want to do that again. Uh, last month we did Hood Canal. So we just, we didn't trailer it to Hood Canal. We just went to Hood Canal. I think next time I would just trailer it to Hood Canal and start at the South End. But the trailering, camping combo, I love, loved it. Yep, okay. highly recommend. And and uh, we were in, Telstar is a sail trimaran. Yeah, folding. And so like a Corsair. I said that was the beginning of Ferrier. Yeah, it was Telstar before Ferrier. Oh, oh, Telstar was yes. made by the people on the East Coast. Yeah. yeah. Tony Smith. Gemini. Tony Smith. Yeah, the Gemini guy. Yeah. So we're real happy. And we're not going to add anything more. Just like keep it simple and um, an outboard and that's it. So the next leg would be uh, Broughton's. And then another year later, maybe that would be the long one to Juno. I, I, I have a few questions that are going back to our original subject. Yeah. He's starting, from, starting from the driveway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take another question online. Uh, maybe, maybe. Uh, Am I muted? Uh, no, oh, okay. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, I, this is Mark Coulter from Salt Spring Island in BC, and I have some questions going back to our original subject. C can you hear me? Oh, I get it. There's people up in BC. Yeah. I, I have a 44-foot trimaran, which is live aboard in Ganges Harbor on Salt Spring Island. And I've looked into some of the research done over the years. The tsunami from the uh, Cascadia fault will be maybe about four or five feet by the time it reached where I moor my boat an hour to an hour and a half later. So I'd often thought that the best thing for me to do is to get my boat out into deeper water so it survived and then come back and see what help I could do. I'd never really known much about the Seattle area fault. Do you know, has there any modeling on how what that would be like once it crossed Juan de Fuca and ended up in the uh, Strait of Georgia. Oh, okay. So I can, can oh, I answer that? that question as well. yeah. yeah. So I'm glad he. Oh, and now there's an echo. I'm glad he asked that. So we, you know, we we've got that modeling for Seattle, which is a totally different ball game than the Cascadian. He's right. It's like four or five feet, and wouldn't I just go out into open water? And because there's time, you've got 90 minutes if he's already close to open water. And have there been other modeling? Yes, they just started working on Bellingham Bay. And that will be, because we don't know until they finish doing the modeling, you don't know what would be the best scenario. Um, so keep in touch with, it's called the tsunami, preparedness group for the state of Washington, and they have a counterpart in British Columbia. If you're up in British Columbia, um, there is a group that works on the tsunami modeling constantly. And they just finished the boater brochure um, at my begging. It's like, I am just so tired with these bar conversations about jumping on your boat and going to sea and all the harbor masters on all the Pacific coast have said, every time they do that, we have rescue after rescue of these because they thought there was one coming and they jumped in their boat and they headed out with old fuel, no water, and we had to go rescue them. <laughs> so the marina managers from Alaska to California are begging the boaters, please don't do that unless you are already out there with fresh fuel and three weeks worth of water and food. And yeah, of course you're going to stay out there, but you can't come back because it's Crescent City or Brookings, Oregon. You don't have anything to come back to. Better you went to your house and started filling out your 
insurance paperwork. But to, um, stay in touch with British Columbia Tsunami Group. And if you don't find them, uh, get a hold of me through Tammy at BainbridgePrepares.org. And I'll try to send you the link to our guy, Dante, who's okay. doing the modeling here. In my, in my case, my boat is my house. Say, so in my case, my boat is my house. And oh, I see. You I have to raise and lower my... the volume. The volume was all the way up. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, in my case, my boat is my house, and I'm likely to be on it when I hear about <laughs> the earth. So the best thing to do is to go out a few miles. In fact, I even saw the local Coast Guard boat heading out because of a tsunami warning that never happened once, and I was on my way back into the harbor. Yeah, I would follow them. And then I'm more likely to be of use to somebody instead of one more homeless person on the, on the shore. And he makes a good point. If his house is the boat, it makes most sense to stay with the boat. If he sees the Coast Guard heading out to deep water, yes. Well, you're unique. I think that would be the thing, that you're more prepared and safer to be offshore if you can get that far. So that's why whenever they say a tsunami, make sure they're talking about the Seattle fault or the Cascadia fault because they're so, so different. We don't yeah. have time with the Seattle fault, but there are some different options with the um, with the Cascadia. And if you're already in the boat and you have nowhere else to go, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was looking at some research a few years ago oh, done I by- uh, again. <laughs> I know he's talking. I was looking at some research done a few years ago by, I think it was University of Victoria. I tried to look it up before this meeting and couldn't find it again. But they're showing just the, the timing and height of the waves of various uh, areas uh, from a Cascadia fault. It showed it to be mild by the time it got in between the islands here. But I thought of it when I was listening to some chats through oh. uh, participants online before you started, who were in um, Anacortes. The Anacortes would be totally wiped out by the tsunamis because they just focused right in from Juan de Fuca from, from the Cascadia Fault. I think I think I would also like you know a little word of caution about following the Coast Guard ship. <laughs> I think I think those things do like 27, 50 knots. I don't know how bad they really are. But if you're doing I'm sorry, I couldn't really hear that. We have 16 families that live on buoys in Eagle Harbor. So I have children, parents, families living full time on buoys. On buoys. It's the only one in the state of Washington, and they're kind of like you, like, I am home. I mean, you know, I, I, they're the only ones that I really, and the ones that live in full time in the marinas, they're struggling because they looked at the modeling and now they have identified a safe boat. Um, for the folks on the buoys, they may not have time to even row in. And I don't know how the buoys are going to act. I don't know if the boats are going to dive and then break. We don't know. Yeah, going to break. Yeah, so, that stuff, it is going to be really hard to get the those things big into our heads because then we just want to say, forget, I don't want to know. I'm hoping what we could do better is just have our go bags, get some more licensing, start having conversations with the emergency management to see if they can start incorporating the voters into their training so that you speak their language. Incident command system has its own language. But the more you're in with them, then you're then you're just more prepared wherever you end up. So in the whole every planet, you have to um great thing is there are a lot of similarities in the fact that the whole plan and preparedness is also very similar. Where uh, there's really nothing you're going to do right away. Like you get forward, this thing is set up, at least the uh, evacuation, all that rescue first. But you know, then all the technically put in and the creation. I don't really. Try 
In his boat, no. I put, I put him on the one sec. Oh, we kind of forget the yeah. Oh, the YouTube is still going back. Oh my god! Really, where we can make that more painless. It'll be painful. There's no way. Um, yeah, but yes, let me. Get out of your way, yeah, so well, you should. Yeah. Let's go, Joe. It's, it's, uh, oh, I have to go. I know. What, where do you go? Oh, yeah, we're on the same one. Well, you're on the I'm going to stay over. Yeah, but don't you go the, go the uh, language barrier? I think if we want to include them in Joe's discussion, then our best bet is all done. So, do you want to? Um, yeah. Where does he sit to talk so that they can hear him? Probably where you were, yeah. Yeah, sit here so that he can. I have hear a bunch you. of things, uh, handouts if anybody wants some. Do one, one each. And uh, who's in charge of the screen here? I have. Do you want to pull something up? Uh, he's probably. Yes. What are we looking at? We're looking at race course, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, I got to share it. Okay. Joe, we have lots of questions already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are questions. So many questions. What, what direction is the course? It doesn't matter. Well, that's a question we have to talk about. <laughs> uh, the way it's described, it's all. Um, a counterclockwise course, but could certainly do it either way or both ways or whatever. We probably okay. Well, trying to make you give you even more screen here. There we go. It could be like the three boys fiasco, whichever way you want. Yep. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> okay. Well, I can do. I'm sure. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Whoops. That didn't do what I wanted. Did you want to go? Okay, well, I'm just trying to get this, uh, this presentation sort of centered so that you can see the whole thing and there's got to be a button to do that it's not moving it to the other side uh, well that's not doing it why uh <laughs> Very old, old school here. Let's try. Yeah. This is a Word document. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It should. It should at least have that. You no, know, the whole thing is there. Yeah. That's not doing what I wanted. Yeah. Uh, let's let's get rid of the uh, let's get rid of these guys. But that won't be in the way. Well, I didn't help to say the future. 
No. Okay, well, let's, uh, I have a, a handout that we're looking at on the screen. We'll go through some of it. Let's uh, see if we can just move down a little bit. This is a, uh, a proposed course for the Port Townsend area. And if I can get this thing to go down. Each up down should work. Oh, it went too far. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. Make sure let's, okay. Okay, so this course starts at Point Hudson, goes out to a mid channel buoy, uh, an AIS buoy in the middle of the channel, back up to Point Wilson, and then back down to Point Hudson. Uh, this. The idea of these courses is that you can do them anytime you want, uh, as many times as you want, pick your conditions, and then you keep a track, you keep your starting time, take a picture of your, your plotter or your course on your cell phone, take a picture at the start, submit your track with a picture of the finish time and send it in to one of our uh, race committee people. I think that's Paul. Are you the fleet captain? Uh, I guess he sent it in to Paul. <laughs> and <laughs> Next slide. Okay. This is one for the Seattle area. No, this is one for the San Juan area starting in Guaymas Channel and going in a counterclockwise direction and up toward Bell Rock and down to another rock here and then back to Guaymas Channel. Uh, okay. Actual buoys or rocks, you know, they're obstacles there that need to go around. <laughs> uh, not everybody does this successfully, so you have to be careful. Uh, yeah, this one. It's uh, in Gravis Channel, goes around Reef Point, Black Rock to Port, Bell Rock to Port, and back to the finish. We have four of these courses, another one in the Seattle area. Okay. These are all clockwise at the moment. Uh, here's one in the Seattle area that uses Meadow Point, Richmond Beach and then one off of Jefferson Head, and then down in Dakota, we have another one. So that's a big, about what they do. Uh, three uh, places so that you get a, a windward leg and a reaching leg and a downwind leg, uh, try and break up the sailing a little bit. They're all about 10 to 15 miles because I wanted a 20 mile course and Vince wanted a 10 mile course. <laughs> so uh, that's sort of a compromise. For the most part, they all use permanent marks. Uh, the exception being the one off of Jefferson Point, which is a, a buoy owned by the Port Madison Yacht Club. And I talked to those guys. They pull their buoy every fall and put it back in place in the spring so that it's available for summer sailing. Uh, but the coordinates for that mark are available on the uh, on the race marks pictures on race marks website. I think you can get to that through uh, Sloop Cavern Yacht Club or Social Bay Yacht Club, a number of them. So the coordinates are there. Uh, shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we have to work out a few details on some of the start and finish lines because uh, at some of them. There's only one end of the pin, one end of the line. We'll need to come up with a coordinate for another one so that you have a, a fixed place where you can start and finish. It's uh, like 10 feet. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but. Anyway, we can work out some virtual 
other ends of the pin there for the Seattle start or the Tacoma start. I think Tacoma has a, a fixed gate. Uh, Port Townsend doesn't and Seattle doesn't, but we'll figure that out. So the question came up, do we go around counterclockwise or can you do both? Uh, and it's sort of up to you. You can do this anytime you want, either direction you want, as many times as you want. Pick your time. Uh, it's all meant to be fun rather than high pressure. You won't have to compete with a lot of other boats. There won't be uh, 15 J105s with the skippers yelling at you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It can, you know, take a bunch of friends out if you want some extra ballast. Uh, whatever you want to do. It's just a fun thing to do. Uh, at the end of the year, sometime maybe the uh, the December meeting or something like that, maybe we can give out some uh, awards to people who have the fastest time for each course, and then maybe the uh, lowest uh, aggregate time for all four courses. Uh, it just depends on what the uh, the group wants to do. Uh, but this is the starting place. We can work out some of the details. So when you're timing, you said you're trying to. Uh, right. All you need is the time. And if you've got a PHRF uh, rating, we'll give you a, a corrected time. Uh, right. We will publish the, the courses and the instructions and the, and the course descriptions on the website. Uh, before the first of the year. So next year we can start this uh, plan if everybody's uh, agreeable. And good incentive to get your boat ready and go sailing. Okay, Vince, that's over my pay grade. <laughs> uh, there's a WordPress plugin for that, but yeah, I think it's even above my pay grade on that one. <laughs> yeah, let's just send our times in to whoever the race captain is. He will come up with your corrected time. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good question, too. The Bay Area. Bay Area Multi Hill Association uh, lets you start from any place on their course. In this particular instance, uh, it would be hard to come up with uh, start finish lines. I, I can do that with virtual waypoints. Uh, and if people want to do that, I will. <laughs> No, there are, except for the San Juans, there are only three places where you can start anyway. Okay, so we're gonna start within start within 15 feet. That, that's a, well, we don't want any collisions with rocks, okay? So if you're gonna be within 15 feet of Lake Rock, I, I think you're gonna be aground. And that's okay. Let, for the first iteration, let's just use the fixed starting points and I'll work on uh, fine tuning it as we go along. Uh, so we have courses sort of spread up and down the sound. So at least one of them should be accessible to most of our members. And uh, it's set up so that if you're going on vacation, you can probably hit two or three or even all four of them at the same same trip. Uh, well, that would be good. We should be able to post post the uh, the results on the website. Yeah. 
No, it doesn't matter. Pick your weather. Okay, I can tell you the business. It, that's, so Vince is going to go out when it's blowing 10 to 15. I'm going to go out when it's blowing 30 to 35. My boat doesn't go in five knots of wind. Corrected time. It doesn't matter. You know, and and pick your ideal weather. You know, pick the weather that's going to make your boat go the fastest. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's uh, that's sort of what I had to say. Any comments from the Google or Zoom group? You don't have to have a PHR ref PHRF rating. Uh, PHRF is sixty dollars a year or something like that. It's not very expensive, and Vince will be glad to set you up with a rating. Oh, you do it? You like fade it out? Vince is our handy. Yeah. <laughs> you have to join PHRF, and then they'll send you a, a sheet where you measure your sail, and then they send that to me, and then I say, "Scientific wild ass guess." Yeah, you know, so this keeps giving me an unfavorable rating. I gotta talk to him about that. I could appeal my rating, couldn't I? God help you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff. I was, I think, well, I'll comment first. I think it's great that uh, this stuff would be on the website because then it would just be kind of fun to see how fast people are going slow, people are doing courses. And then I would propose that every year that's latest, if you race with exception of the fastest time, for each, each course. Oh, oh no, that's good. I like that. No, it's, it's an annual trophy and a perpetual for the fastest. Anyway, this, this part of the proposal goes out to the awards committee. Well, I'm sure people will keep their own historic records. I'd certainly plan to. You know, okay. Kind of set a record. Yeah. Seattle for Townsend. You know, you get a big southern blow. And, yeah. Yeah. Really, I don't I never saw it last week. Yeah, yeah right. Like, oh, <laughs> that was the right time to do it. Started here right okay. time. Is somebody <laughs> monitoring the Zoom? Yeah. Uh, no, no questions on the chat. Okay, no questions on the chat. Okay, okay guys, that's all I got. Uh, so, like, so implementation. Well, how shall we? Okay, so implementation. I will fine tune the uh, coordinates for the courses and have that posted the website by the first of the year. Okay. We'll have rules. They won't be very many, but they're just. A couple. Uh, it'll be basically modeled on what uh, Bay Area Multi Health Association does, and uh, we'll make it sort of consistent so that uh, people have a good baseline from which to work. Uh, we will get together with some people, just, and I don't know who. Uh, we'll have elections shortly, and we'll have a new uh, bash of faces uh, in the officers' positions. Except for Vince, who's running again. No, it, it's all fine. We'll get something set up in place for the first of the year. We will have an awards program. We'll have courses. And we will have uh, some way of uh, getting all this up on the website. Cool. That's ambitious, but we'll do it.
However you want to do it. Sure. Uh, and most of these marks, at least in the Seattle area, are marks that are used by most of the races uh, out of social. So should be pretty straightforward. Well, yeah, uh huh. Oh, is it? Okay. Oh. Okay, but you're from Tacoma. This this course works for you? Okay. Yeah, there are plenty of races you can get into, uh, but for people who don't particularly want to race, uh, and there are some of them in our group, uh, this gives them an opportunity to go out and sail and uh, develop their skills, have a good time on the water, I hope. Yeah, I think it's uh, I'm signed up for Snowbird number one. Actually, I'm signed up for the series. I will not make Snowbird number two. We'll be in Portland. But we will be doing the rest of those. We'll be doing the Iceberg race. That's in January. That's a Stoop Tavern race. Uh, anything else that we can sort of squeeze into our schedule until until the Pacific Northwest Offshore next May. Come on, guys. Step it up. So we'll be doing that. And I'm entered in the Pacific Cup. Uh, 